Today's guest was a fixture on the sidelines at the Minot State Dome. Joining me now, it's Sheila Green Gurdon. You have accomplished a lot of stuff around the Magic City as the women's basketball coach of the Beavers. But first of all, how much have you guys been using my Keurig since picking it up on Facebook Marketplace? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of good stuff, like, you know, being done as Keurig. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 never could, uh, I never could use it quite enough. I hope you guys are just giving it a better home. <laughs> Well, they used it as much as they thought they would. Is <laughs> exactly. So let's go back a little like further than just a couple months ago when we made the purchase here. What do you kind of remember the most when it comes to your Hall of Fame career at Montana State Northern? Oh, my gosh. Montana State Northern? Yep. Well, that was a really long time ago. Um, what I remember most is we had – teams full of talented players and we played in front of a packed house literally packed house every night and we won we won a lot and we had a lot of fun doing it and I just think back to all those great memories um, great friendships um, ones that are still going strong 30 some years later and really think that um, what you take away from that was just learning how to win and have success, making memories along the way, and continuing on with those relationships and fond memories. So after crushing it at Montana State Northern, how do you kind of consider and ultimately land upon going to uh, Billings, not only to work with your counseling degree and then assistant coaching? Because obviously a big part of your story is coaching overall, and that was your, I guess, your start perhaps? Yeah, you know, uh, I knew Frank McCarthy um, from playing against him, and he was actually looking for um, an assistant coach. And my coach at Northern had actually offered me an assistant position too as a grad assistant, but I saw it as a great opportunity to go learn a new system um, from a guy who worked really hard in a great Division II program and took advantage of that and really did, did a lot of learning during those years. I think Frank did a lot of forming, I guess, my techniques and, and learning how to work hard. That guy worked hard than anybody I ever know. How important do you think it is for new coaches to broaden their horizons in the sense of just learning the systems, like you said, a new system? Well, I think it's good to, you know, you're trying to develop your own philosophy. And so if you get a variety of philosophies to hold the things that you want to take away, then you become who you are. I mean, Lauren Baker was my coach for years. Um, he then took over the men's program. Sherry Wynn came in. Um, she was a former uh, Olympic athlete in team handball and went on and won the national championship and had great success in her coaching career. And then working with Frank McCarthy, um, just really had a lot of opportunity. And then I spent a lot of time with Don Meyer, um, who was one of the greatest coaches in the nation. Uh, at the, tried to spend time with um, great coaches like John Wooden and um, our Tennessee Bulls coach, Pat Summit. Uh, just really spent time exploring coaches. Where did, like, your – that's actually something that uh, Jason Schwartz mentioned too, his connections with some of the bigger coaches around the country, really, in history. Where did you kind of, like, I don't know, come between – Wooden and Pat Summit. Where's that connection from? Well, Pat Summit was my hero all the way growing up, and I read her. I watched her games. I went out and spent time with her a couple different times. And I think maybe when I first started, I might have had a Pat Summit approach. Um, but John Wooden kind of helped me understand that not fair to treat all players the same. And I think early in my career, I probably treated them all the same and was probably hard on all of them, which may be okay at that time. But sometimes kids coach differently, and you want to get the best out of every kid. You have to find out what makes them tick. So you had time around the NAIA before coming to Minot State. So when you get to Minot State, why was that the right job for you at the time? I just remember playing at Minot State, and, and what a – great town and a great facility and 
when I had an opportunity to come out here and interview, I just thought, wow, there's so much potential here. Um, just a great place to recruit to, and everybody made me feel really welcome, and I just saw it as being a great opportunity. And it really was in a tough situation, so I felt like there was really nowhere else we could go but up. Um, and just really fell in love with the opportunity and was very fortunate to land that uh, job. And it's one thing to decide that it's the right place for you to make a move. And then as time goes on, what made it the place to be for a long time? You know, I don't think at first I thought it was going to be a long time. I was a Montana girl. I loved her. My dream was the alma mater. Um, but it was funny. The longer I stayed here, the more we saw things develop. And I saw this as a great place and wanted to stay here. I at my alma mater because I felt a better one. Um, and just really, honestly, part of it is my husband's fault. Um, <laughs> I, met, I met him and um, just knew that he wasn't going to, didn't want to move. And, you know, we made this our home, and I, I don't regret that decision. Awesome. So you kind of mentioned some of the coaches that you took away from, but let's talk about what a Sheila Green girding coach team looks like in regards to just scheme, attitude, identity? How would you answer that? Well, I guess the, the thing that, Ben, I would always hope is that I always wanted our kids to walk off the court feeling like they gave everything they had. Um, I wanted coaches and fans for playing at home. Okay? And the big emphasis was always on the defensive end because I felt there was always going to be nights uh, that the ball wasn't going to go in the hole. And so we, we played very hard defensively. And, you know, we tried to run as much as possible. Three out, two in, motion offense kind of team. Um, well, we made it more when Curly and Chris Bogle were here. Uh, but when you didn't have much for post play because it was so hard to land post players, um, you know, sometimes you had to tweak what you did and run a four out one home, or maybe you run more sets based on your personal. What made it difficult about acquiring the post players? Honestly, everybody in the country. Mm-hmm. And the posts are hard to find, especially ones that have good feet, good hands, and good size. So when we were NAI, we had a lot of luck finding kids that had good hands, good feet and not a lot of size. Um, we could manage with the undersized post player like a Mackenzie Mack or Caroline Fulven or my first few years, Tiffany Hagan was, as we went division two, we just couldn't survive with the small You had to get bigger kids to play in the, in the North and compete at that level. Okay. Um, you already naturally brought up a bunch of player names here. Who would you say were the, the best that you've had in a Beaver uniform and ultimately some of like the best years as a team. What were some of the best teams you had? It was definitely our first year in the Northern South. Carly Boak, um, Morgan Close, uh, Alicia Jones, Katie Hardy. Uh, I could go on with others, but that was a pretty solid team. Um, we went 19-9 and nine that year and ended up in the top eight tournament down in Sioux Falls. Um, so that was a really fun year. But, you know, it goes way back then. Like you think about that first year and, and walking into a team that had won two games in two years, and we started working hard and, and just they thought I was all crazy. Like, what's this woman doing? And they hated me. Like they truly hated me, <laughs> but they loved each other and they went through something really tough together. And that love became united on the court. And that team that was picked last in the league went on to win the league and make the national tournament for the first time ever. And I really feel like that group of kids, you know, Tiffany Hagel, Carla Brunzel, um, Alicia, um, oh my goodness, Alicia, Ali Olson, um, just a, a great group of kids. Um, Andrew Harrell was a kid out of Botno that we, we took from the junior college up there. It was just a real average point guard. But she was the glue that helped that team be successful. And so that team will always be very dear to my heart because – they turned everything around in the right direction. And they went on the year after that and beat Mary and went on to the national tournament again. And then it seemed like we kind of just were fortunate to make the national tournament as time went on. And I don't know why, 
I test this to trip years, but we always took a big trip on an odd year, hmm. Hawaii, California, Florida. We never made the national tournament on those odd years, but for some reason we made them on even years. I don't know if we're more rested. You know, the, the, one of the greatest teams, I think, the greatest stories, I guess you'd have to say, was the 2008 team when those, uh, those kids had got sent home in the second round of playoffs. We were rated number 27 in the country, and we thought our season was ended by South Dakota Mines with a second-round loss. Everybody left. All the kids went home for spring break. We had a couple kids that went to Mexico, um, another one that went to Mexico with their family. We had kids in Wyoming, and we had to call these kids after we found out on a Monday that we made the national tournament at large birth and get them all back to Minot after a week and a half of no practice. They showed up, went to the national tournament, ranked number 28 in country, knocked off the number four team, knocked off the number seven team in double overtime, and then we went on and hit a last-second shot against the defense champions the morning side we were in the eight eight and when we hit the shot we celebrated thought we were moving on to the final four because the referee counted it then they decided they better review it and then they came back and discounted the basket so we made the final four for about five minutes <laughs> oh man so uh there was a question or a point that you brought up a couple minutes ago about uh the girls maybe they didn't have like the, the best time is you kind of work through the grind of developing the team early on. You're like, oh, maybe they hated me or whatever. Did you ever feel, like, sorry for, like, the work <laughs> you had to tell them to put in at all? No. <laughs> no, I, not at all. Because you I felt it. like – Yeah. Well, I just felt like they didn't have the work ethic. Like, they didn't understand what it took. And if they would understand it and, – and a great example is we went to Regina, Canada for our first game. And we got beat by four. It's awful. It was embarrassing. And yet at the same time, I just felt like this is where we're at right now. We just got to keep working. Mm -hmm. So then – um, three. All right. So uh, obviously okay. uh, we, we've talked about just what your teams look like and stuff, and uh, that, was, that was definitely a, a time that you had to help the girls get better. And it, it's not always easy, that's for sure. Um, as you kind of look back, what do you kind of think is the biggest accomplishment Minot State had with you? Um, you don't know. I don't, I don't know. I really think that um, accomplishments as a coach are really just being blessed with kids that committed themselves to your program. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get them there, and they can have all the talent in the world, but unless they really just put themselves out there every day, it's really hard to be successful. And I don't think any coach is successful without great kids and great coaches and great just that's why any kind of award that, that you say is out there, you know, greatest moment. Really great wins are great players. I feel like sometimes screw up. <laughs> and players just make it happen and, and they get it done and you try to put them in position to do that, but care about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now that you're at another spot here, tell us a little bit about what you're up to now with South Prairie and how you've been able to stay with coaching with the Royals teams. Good job as a school counselor out at South Prairie. I started out as the K-12 counselor for the first two years, and now I'm 6-12 through 12 counselor. Um, started out with Jordan Cooper, helping with the boys program, and um, just really enjoyed Jordan. You know, I knew Jordan as a player. Uh, he's a great young man and, and a great, great coach. Pushes his guys hard. Um, you know, South Prairie's been growing and had to take, has taken a lot of lumps, but I think he finally got some success this last year um, and, and was rewarded for all his hard work and effort. And I've switched over now. Um, my girls are in 6th and 8th grade, so I coach 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and then 9th through 12th. I assist um, with the girls' program. What's it been like uh, coaching your kids nowadays? I've seen you, I think – Makaya was playing at the Y uh, as of late as well. What's that been like? I love it. I just I just really enjoy it. And honestly, I, I feel that, um, you know, God put you in the right place at the right time and, and put me in a place where I needed to be for my kids. Um, they both had travel teams the last three years. Um, I've been able to be with them every weekend. 
we have practices a couple of times a week, and then we also have all the school ball stuff. So um, I don't think I'd have been able to do all that uh, in the position that I was in. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that I am able to share that with them because they grow up awful fast. Yeah, for real. So what do you want to get – or what do you want kids to get out of the experience of playing basketball at – different levels that you've coached? Well, I think every level is different. You know, I think, um, you know, third grade, fourth grade, and, and I've done camps for many, many, many years, and I think this kind of attests to what I think. But with your younger kids, your kindergarten through sixth grade, you want them to have a blast. Like, just have fun, enjoy it, learn the skills of the game, but you want them to get excited about basketball. And then as they get into seventh and eighth, you still want that same excitement, but maybe it's starting to be where you're going to start figuring out that winning and losing is pretty important. Um, I have a really hard time hiding that. <laughs> um, I'm pretty competitive, and sometimes I'm across, I come across a little harsh. My daughter usually informs me of how harsh I was when I get home, but um, I just I expect kids to play at a higher level the older they get. And I think if you expect them to reach a level that they're capable of, they will give you everything they can to get there. If you set the expectations too high, then you're setting them up for failure. So I think that every level, you just have to set the expectations that are reachable, but that's going to help them move beyond what they think they're capable of. Awesome. So um, who do you think has had the absolute biggest impact on you within – just your basketball playing and coaching career? That's tough. I don't know if I could pinpoint one person. Um, you know, I, I just think of my heroes. You know, I, I mentioned John Wooden, Pat Summit, um, John Wooden. It, you know, but I look at my coach in college, and he made me just love the game. And he believed in me so much that I wanted to be just like him when I became a coach. Like I wanted to make people feel good, but I also wanted to get the most out of them. And so I think he really had a big influence in my life. But I also think that just my, my right hand man and the guys I got to coach with and people that were my assistant coaches had a big impact too. I mean, coach Wahog and I coached together for 19 years and coach Wahog is the kindest, nicest man you'd ever know. That's got a plethora of, basketball knowledge and Bill Triplett and he were probably the two that tamed me because there was times okay, and sometimes I wanted to say things that maybe I shouldn't <laughs> and they probably calmed me down and told me to think it over and just really taught me a lot about control and then I had a husband who had to let me know uh, about my body language on the sidelines uh, he asked me if my foot stomping would help us win more games or if my arms folded in disgust, made my players feel good, and he really made me self-aware of a lot of things. <laughs> um, and I just try to always improve. Like, I think when you're done learning, you're through. And I think you got to constantly just try to improve yourself as a coach and hopefully be the best you can for your players and get the most out of them. Awesome. So I guess the, uh, the next chapter for Sheila is to keep rolling at South Prairie right now or what? Ben, we're going to do great things there. I'm, I'm just saying, we got some kids that are very, very dedicated, kids that are really playing hard, and I can't wait to see in a few years how Southbury bas girls basketball has turned around. And I'm just really excited about the, the direction our program is going and, and the kind of kids that we have in our program as a whole. I just think that um, we've got a lot of great young athletes in our sports and great kids and, and I think our administration gives us everything we need to try to help them be successful and, and I'm just excited for our future there. Fantastic. We'll all be uh, watching you guys there uh, down south on the prairie. Uh, Sheila, this has been great. Really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks a lot. You bet, Ben. Great visiting with you.